there's been lots of member changes and things like that, but basically Nectar is still going. So t- tell us a little about what you're up to. Well, we, we have uh, just released a new album, Mission to Mars. Um, this is the second album uh, since I got back into the music in uh, 2018. Uh, this is a second album. COVID interfered terribly with everything, you know. Uh, yeah. We did we did the album The Other Side and we're just touring with it and when COVID hit and it took us out. We would plan to go all the way down the West Coast and it, it was it was impossible. So we had uh, a couple of years where we did nothing. We've done four or five tours now with uh, with Nectar uh, since I came back. And the band right now is a four-piece. Well, it's five-piece with Marianne. Um, we are, we are uh, guitar, bass, drums, and keyboards, and we've just recorded um, and released Mission to Mars. Uh, have you heard Mission to Mars? No, I haven't yet. Oh, you, you, yeah. you're definitely in for a treat. It's 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 more in our rock roots. Um, we did uh, a tour in June and in August, and we went to we did headlined a festival in. Uh, in UK, uh, in September, and we played the entire new album, and they'd never heard it before, apart from the odd one or two that had got an advanced copy. Uh, nobody had heard it before, and it really went down well. I, I, I have I have a lot of good feelings about this album. I think uh, I think we've got a winner. Well, tell me a little about how the recording. Uh, happened and uh, how long did it take you to record to write it? Well, we, we wrote it over the last three years, um, and Rich, Rich Shalanda and myself. And then uh, when we uh, came off tour, um, we, oh, when was it? Last year uh, in September, we were we were off tour and we were. Uh, recording, not recording, but rehearsing the new music. Uh, it was me and Kendall and Rich uh, in the basement. We we're putting some finishing touches, and we were. Uh, re- ra- uh, Kendall came up with some new ideas, which we really liked. Um, and Ron came, uh, Ron Howden, who's been together with me for sixty years, and. Uh, we said, do you have a listen to the new stuff? So he came and had to listen to it, and he played a little bit of drums on it, although there was no cymbals. We had some drums set up in the corner. And he said, yeah, give me give me a thumb drive, and uh, I'll work something out, what you know, what, what we're going to do with it. Uh, so that was on Sunday. And on Monday night, he was taken into hospital with a brain bleed, and he died. Mm. And so now we're looking for a new drummer, and... Uh, um, we put a, we put a drum call out if you like. We rented a studio to to check him out, and the second guy to come in was Jay Dittemore. And Jay used to play with Rich Shalanda and Kendall Scott in Flying Dreams. Um, so they wanted me to hear him and play with him and see how it went, and it, he did phenomenal job. And he told us that Ron had approached him in 2017. And said, "Look, I, I have cancer. If, if ever I can't play, I want you to play for me." Mm. And and Jay said to him, "This this is your gig. You you play on." And Ron continued playing. Of course, we were we had to be cognizant of when his chemo was and when we were out touring, you know, uh, because that was important. And uh, so uh, Jay fit great. I mean, he fit really well with the band. So we had a couple of days rehearsal with him at Richard's studio, and then we took it down to Shawfire Studios in Long Branch, New Jersey, with Joe DeMeo, and we did the basic tracks of Mission to Mars in two days. Uh, we always do the the basic tracks live, and then we build on it. So then we give the tape to Rich, and Rich in his studio, he put all the guitars down, and they were great. He and I were on Zoom, listening to it, talking about it. But I, I really loved loved it. It was great. Mm. And uh, I had him change the solo in "I'll Let You In" because I heard more of a 
melodic George Harrison type solo, which is what he ended up with, uh, that flavour. And that's, that's how it sounds great. It's something that is going to be mem memorable. memorable. <laughs> um, and uh, we, we then handed it to Kendall to do his work on it. And uh, we then we gathered in uh, New Jersey. I went, I live in North Carolina. So I went up to New Jersey and we, um, we were going to do vocals. So I, I went up a few days early to make sure we got all the lyrics finished because we'd been working on lyrics individually and with Zoom. Um, and so Rich and I sat at his kitchen table and wrote the rest of the lyrics. And then we went in the studio and it went great. We put all the vocals down. We we uh, uh, did some acoustic guitar. Um, we uh, we started the mix, and the, the it went really well. We we really liked what we heard, and uh, we had we went we took that home. Then I had a few tweaks with Joe, uh, you know, tweak this, tweak that, just a little bit, bring it up. When we got it to where we wanted it, then we sent it to Australia to. Uh, Leon Zervos, who used to be the head guy at Sterling Sound in New York, which mm -hmm. was one of the major uh, uh, mastering places. For sure, yeah. He worked with us before on the other side, so he, he knew what we were looking for. We are looking for air around each instrument, so you get a good feel. You can follow whichever instrument you want when you listen to it. And it's very important that the mastering is done that way. And also, with a different mastering from the CD to the vinyl. The vinyl requires a different type of mastering uh, to get the sound. We kept the the uh, length down to about 16 minutes uh, because at that output, you get the best out of the vinyl. You get a bigger groove, so you get nice bottom end. You know, it, it's a lot cleaner. Um, and uh, the, the vinyl just came out. Uh, in in the last, it's not really out until October, but it's they've got them they've got them in stock now and they're starting to ship. And the vine, the CD's been out oh, about uh, a month, maybe August that came out. Yeah, it's about a month that's been out, and that's doing really well. I mean, it's uh, I'm surprised that you've not got it. Did Chip didn't send it to you yet, right? Well, I, I'm going to uh, email him and ask him to do that. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah, 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 you, yeah, yeah. I could send it to you electronically, but yep. he should he should give you a physical copy. Yeah, I still listen to CDs. Um, I've got LPs too, but I find that CDs are the the most portable and convenient because I can put it in right. a get a blaster anywhere in the house or take it in the car. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> I use a thumb drive in the, in the car. Oh, but, okay. I have a CD player as well. Yeah. Uh, the thing is with CDs, there are some frequencies that are not on CDs because the CD uh, assumes that your ears will pop them in. You don't get the full spectrum like you do with a, uh, a, a, a record, you know. Really? That's why records are coming back. They're a lot warmer. But the only, the only drawback for me is uh, with records – well, it's not a drawback. I mean, you really have to focus on it. <laughs> you have to turn it over, sit there and listen to it. You have to set aside time, say, yeah, I'm going to sit down and listen to this, which is a good thing. Whereas uh, putting it on your computer and all that, it's very easy to get distracted and start looking at your phone while you're listening to music. Or, right, right, right. Yeah. I think you like it. You know, If you were into a prog at all, uh, this the new album ranges from... Uh, rock right through to prog. There's, there's some prog in it, but um, there's some rock in it too. It's, it's, mm -hmm. It rocks hard, uh, and I like that. I'd like to ask you a little more about the prog aspect, because like I said, I grew up kind of on prog. I really got into prog as a youngster when I was 10 or 11. Got into Mike Oldfield in the late 70s, uh, you know, uh, Tubular Bells, Tubular and Bell. then then getting into all the a lot of the classic prog rock bands. Nectar formed in G Germany. That's interesting. You you're actually English, but you were in G Germany at the time, I guess. Yeah, we, we uh, lived in Germany for almost twelve years. Uh, the German public were very accepting of our music. Um, the, the England at the time was into pop music, 
and Germany was not into pop music music at all. Uh, from what we saw, they wanted something new, and prog music is actually uh, melodic. It's it's melodic, and it's it's got maybe different time signatures. It's more interesting uh, than pop, and and therefore it it took off as a uh, as a, a genre. However, uh, prog is not recognised by, for instance, uh, the Hall of Fame. Uh, there's no prog in all. It's not. It's like it doesn't exist. You know. Well, they and, did finally come around. They didn't. They th to Russian. Yes, they finally came around to Russian. Yes, in the Prague Hall of Fame. I, oh, yeah. in the Hall of Fame. The in the Cleveland, right? You mean oh, Cleveland, they, Ohio? I, yeah, I'm yeah. Talking, yeah. I mean, they, they they never caught up. They they should have done a sweep in the beginning and brought people in who deserve to be in because there are people now that deserve to be in that are not in. I don't know that how they're running it, but it's not a good way of running it. Uh, no. I know England has a, uh, a prog um, um, Hall of Fame, if you like, and we were just inducted in, in 2020 into the Hall of Fame in St. Louis as a outside influence, uh, which was interesting, and we like that. I think that this band's going to do something with it. Uh, they I'll Let You In has been taken on by a lot of Christian stations. Um, it's been, it's, it's, it's crossed over. And Mission to Mars is on the standard rock uh, channels. And on, uh, I see a lot of uh, college stations taking it on. Oh, cool. Cool. So that's, that's pretty cool. And, and One Day High, One Day Low is the most prog song on the album. And we'll probably uh, push that next. Uh, there's only four songs. There's uh, Mission to Mars, um, Long Lost Sunday, One Day High, One Day Low, and I'll Let You In. Just four songs in the whole CD, you mean? Four songs in the whole CD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Ten minutes, some, of them, you know, some of them are longer. Uh, most huh. of them are longer, actually. We are going to do a trilogy. This is going to be the first album in a trilogy. So cool. we're already we're already writing the next stuff that's coming that's coming out. Great, because that was kind of my next question. It was sort of like, what kind of vision do you have as artists, as musicians? And well, you've already kind of explained that. Now you've got a a, a trilogy. You've got concept albums. Um, so what is your goal when you're making music? Is it just uh, is it's? I know musicians. We tend to just have this in us, and we'll, we just need to kind of play. We need to. To, just to do it or just um so well, what's sort of driving you uh derek i like very much the music that we're turning out i uh, i i uh i like to visualize uh our fans who we call nectarines by the way uh, <laughs> i i imagine them uh listening to it and when we go on tour especially what we've just done uh where we played the whole new album I just told him, I told you we get do some new music and here it is. And it went down as well as all the classic stuff, which is great. I mean, from not hearing it at all to hearing it and standing ovation. I mean, that, that was big for us. You know, I, I really felt that, that uh, uh, it was a big step forward. So I, I'm, I'm uh, I want to push this album first, but we are already starting to work on the next one. Well, I've got a, a Patreon member supports my channel. His name is Aki, and he had me. He had some questions he wanted me to ask for you. Is that okay if I uh, pass Ooh. those along to you? Whatever okay. you want. All right. So Aki in Japan says he loves Nectar, especially Remember the Future and Recycled. Great albums. He says, "Why did you decide to play in Germany and not the UK?" Well, that, I answered that in UK. Okay. It was all pop music, and we didn't want to play pop music. So we, we went to uh, Europe. We actually went to the American bases. We were playing American bases hmm. uh, in Germany. And then we crossed over and went to the American uh, the public. And it was great. You know, we uh, we eventually were, we were in the Star Club in Hamburg and we're in the Top Ten Club in Hamburg. And one of our members, Colin Edwards, left. And we reached out to Royal Albrighton who had been jamming with uh, Ron at the Ron in the Star Club in the afternoon. And we said, well, let's give it a shot. And with the first gig we played, we, we jammed the whole gig. We'd never played together. 
So we jammed the whole gig and it went down really well. We decided to call the band Nectar and we decided to put in a K in it because it was a hard, harder rock, uh, not knowing that Nectar with a K is a German spelling of Nectar, you know. We decided there and then that we would write our own music. I mean, we, all, we were all capable. We, we, we've all dabbled in it. And uh, from then on, we just wrote our own music. And what year are we talking about here? 69, 70. Right. Okay. So it's uh, plus six, uh, 55 years. Yeah, amazing. And when you started, like, because you were right at the beginning there of, of what's known now as progressive rock, were you, like, thinking certain bands in your mind that, oh, I like what they're doing, let's kind of go that direction? Or was it just sort of spontaneous? It was spontaneous. We We knew what we were looking for. We were listening to a lot of different bands at the time, Vanilla Fudge, uh, Chicago had some great stuff. Um, I think a lot of them in that, I mean, Beatles were huge. Um, the Beatles were, in my opinion, probably the first prog band. Um, they, they did a lot of marvellous stuff. Um, I really like uh, Paul McCartney's bass playing. I think he's he's got a very melodic bass. That's how I play. I play a melodic bass. Um, I don't play the, the same as uh, most bass players play. I, I play with a cello in mind, you know, hmm. uh, more, uh, more melodic. If you're mm -hmm. listening to Remember the Future, that's very melodic. As far as so is recycled. Mm -hmm. um, I think if if you like uh, the old band, the original band, you're gonna love this new stuff. Uh, I think it's uh, it's a, it's the next progression, you know. He had another question. He said, "What did you think of Iron Maiden's cover of King of Twilight?" I, I thought it was great. Steve uh -huh. Harris has been a fan for a long time, and uh, he obviously convinced the rest of the band, seeing as he writes most of the music. Uh, to do uh, uh, Crying in the Dark, uh, King of Twilight. And uh, it, I think they did a great job on it. Uh, I was very, I was flattered. Uh, we, we made some money with it, which, which uh, was, a, was uh, a plus. But, um, and he's been to a couple of gigs. I've not seen him recently. I, I understand that they are going to be touring. I would love to tour with them. I mean, oh, I, I think... Yeah. I think that would be a, a, a big thing. This is their last tour, apparently, um, but I haven't been able to reach anybody. That would be awesome. Um, one last question that uh, Aki had. He said, the atmosphere of the album cover of Magic as a Child is different from the others. What made you decide to use Brooke Shields for the album cover? Well, we didn't know it was Brooke Shields. We didn't know. The, the photographer did. Um but we need. We were looking for an album cover. Uh, actually, we should have gone back to Benske, but we left Germany. I mean, we are we are. Uh, the last two albums have been uh, Benske uh, covers. Uh, Benske did Re "Remember the Future," did uh, "Sounds Like This," uh, "Tab in the Ocean," um, "Recycled." All them albums were done with uh, Benske uh, covers, which are great. The latest cover, the new one from Mission to Mars, is a great, great cover. And uh, that one was a, was the odd man out, if you like. Um, the photographer came back with the concept, and we liked it. And uh, Brooke Shields was, I think, 13 years old then. Uh, she'd not done the, what they call the, the one that she, the, she, the, the film that she was in that was was famous for at that, uh, that time. Right. That, that yeah, had yeah. not come out yet. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, she was great. I mean, she I know, I know that she has it in her portfolio or, or had it in her portfolio at the time, which mm -hmm. was uh, which was good. It was flattery, you know. And you, I just feel positive when anybody is leaning towards us, listening to us or uh, admiring covers. A lot of the covers sold the album. People would buy uh, Rem Remember the Future because of the cover. Uh, they looked at the cover, wanted to hear what the music was like, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I, I, uh, I'm, as I said, I'm very happy about that. 
So I'll probably interject here the cover of your new album, uh, Mission to Mars. Tell me a little about the the concepts that you work with as you're writing uh, lyrics. How do you approach uh, writing lyrics? Is it is it like writing a book or is it like a poem or is it something that you're drawing out of your soul or how does it go for you? It's totally different. Oh. When we uh, when we we were writing the the music, we're not really thinking of lyrics, although sometimes Rich will do scat lyrics. You know, this is how I hear it sort of thing, you know. What happens is um, I came up with Mission to Mars. It just came to me. I thought, man, that sounds great. Let's do Mission to Mars. You know, we did the other side, uh, the last one, and I, I mentioned it to Rich, and Rich right away, yeah, let's do that as a theme. So we did, and we started writing individually. He would write and I would write. And then... Um, as I said, before we went in the studio, I went up there a week early and we sat on his kitchen table and wrote the lyrics. Lyrics will will just come to you uh, if you if you uh, uh, if you think about it hard without pushing, relax, let it happen. The words will come to you. We we wrote uh, the lyrics for I'll let you in maybe 20 minutes, half an hour. And uh, that was very emotional. Um, we had we were tearing up on some of the parts of that. It just seemed to feel good, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I think when you let the lyrics happen, then you'll know when it's right, when they're the right lyrics. You'll know when the this is going to carry the song or the song is going to carry the lyric, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but we were very happy uh, with the uh, with the lyrics to the album. Um, I, I've been involved with writing lyrics from day one, from the first album in in nineteen seventy. Um, me and Mick uh, Brockett, the light show guy, we wrote most of the lyrics. Ron would scat sing, pretty much like like Rich does. He would scat sing, and he would come up with some finished parts. He would come up with a lot of of scat parts. How he heard it, because um, we do it. Used to do a lot of a lot of the stuff live before it was finished. I mean, on the on the recycled tour, recycle wasn't even out. We'd not recorded it, and we opened the show with recycled. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, just, it just felt good. Let's play it. You know, mm -hmm. um, I, I think uh, once you allow things to happen both musically and and uh and lyrically it, it'll come to you it'll come in your head and you know uh I, i've had t i've had times where i woke up some lyrics have come to my head hmm. and i have to get up and write them down hmm. or talk them into my phone where whichever yeah 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 and then uh that when they're ready to be used uh, I use them sometimes. I'm talking to Rich on the on the uh, on Zoom, and I hear something. He mentions something. I write it down. Or I think about something. I write it down. And then when you come to do the lyrics, you've got some things to draw from. You know, yeah. not it, it. It doesn't always happen right away. But if you've got something to push it, it does. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I, it's it's maybe a. A different way. I don't know how other people do it. Be honest with you. We always write the music first, and then come the lyrics. Well, I'm glad you're approaching it just uh, intuitively because I think that's probably the best the best way to do it. And you mentioned the Beatles. I mean, uh, watch watching that uh, documentary that came out recently. All those hours of them working on one of the final albums, and they were coming up with the tunes and showing something uh, right off the first morning he's got it. And, and then, that's uh, the, yeah, that's when I realized that uh, McCartney played a lot, sim very similar to how I play. Yeah. He has the same sort of attack on it, you know? Um, and if you read uh, some of their books, how they write lyrics, they, they pick lines out of a newspaper or on a billboard or, you know, some, sometimes things just come to you that start a series of of, uh, of words. You approach bass as a as a melodic person, a melodic 
writer. Uh, I was curious when you're working on your last album, the, the 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 latest album, Mission to Mars. Are you precious about how you play your bass? I mean, does it have to be a certain bass? Like, does it have to be exactly right, or are you just basically just trying to catch a catch it on tape, kind of, or what? Uh, I have a few basses. Um, my Fender uh, jazz bass, I played most of the time on the other side, but I, I played my Rickenbacker on uh, the new album. Um, it just sounds great. I mean, my Rickenbacker has uh, two Fender Precision pickups in the middle, so I'm able to mix the pickups. The Rickenbacker gives me the growl, and the Fender gives me the push. I generally play very trebly uh, because the treble, a treble bass will travel a lot farther than a bassy bass. A bassy bass, when you get 20 feet into the audience, it's just mush, where a trebly bass will be punchy. It's the same frequency, it's the same depth, but the trebly note will, get, will push a lot further than a bassy bass. Um, you'll hear a lot of bands and the bass sounds like mush, and that's why uh, they don't they, they don't think about how it travels. You know, um, I I, uh, I generally have a good feel for what I want to play. Uh, if I hear something, I can play a melody right with it without really thinking about it. it comes right into my head. This is what you should be playing, um, and it's not always what would normally be played, but it, it works. It feels good, you know. We do uh, remember the future uh, on stage, and uh, the melodies of the bass, to me, still st still uh, hold up. It feels good, you know. The, the, you're able to uh, play different parts uh, that blend in uh, so that people can, can hear it. You, you you're not all playing at once and making a mush. You 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 you're gently suggesting and singing over it. You know. And how are you enjoying performing live and doing some touring? Uh, how do you find touring uh, as you get uh, more mature in life? <laughs> yeah. Is it harder for you? Or That's a nice way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I think that. Uh, Touring is something that you do because you want to do it. When we did The Other Side, uh, I corralled uh, Randy Dembo, who used to play with Nectar after I left in 78. Um, he played with them for a couple of years. And I, count, I got I put him in the band because I figured he could play bass and he could play 12-string guitar. And I was thinking we would do The Other Side, and then, which turned out to be a double album, uh, we'll play the other side and then I'll step back and let him play the bass and go out on tour. Uh, I had no intentions of touring at the time. But once we got the other side finished, I enjoyed it so much. I wanted to see the look on people's faces when they first heard it. Um, I, it's, uh, uh, it's a joy, really. When you play music and you see people are enjoying it, it feels good. Uh, are you a musician? Yes, I am. <laughs> what do you play? I play guitar mostly, but I also play bass and cello. Uh, oh, and cool! Keyboards and I sing. And uh, well, you know exactly what I'm talking about with the cello. The cello, oh, yeah. the cello parts are just a little bit higher bass lines. Yeah. So the, yeah. The, if if you uh, if you get away from the bump, ba bump, bump, ba bump bass, and you get into a melody, then uh, it makes playing wonderful. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I started off playing classical piano. Oh, okay. So once you know what what the chords are in your on your keyboard, you can figure if there's five notes that each one of them you can play on the bass, and yeah. it'll be right. You don't yeah. have to play the root. You can play the fifth or the third or whatever. Um, yeah. And that general will start a run that's not, I won't say not normal, but it's not normal. Who was your inspiration as a bass player then uh, in your formative years and maybe even now? I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I liked uh, Tim Bogart. Uh, 
from Vanilla Fudge was a great bass player. And I like Paul McCartney uh, as a bass player. From day one, I like Paul McCartney as a bass player. Yeah. But there's other people like John Lodge, Moody Blues, that that have that melodic feel. You know, they're not just a bass player. Um, I, I think uh, there's lots of examples uh, of melodic bass, and there's lots of examples of rock bass. You know, the, the rock bass is, is important too. Uh, you have a little bit of mix of both, I think, is, is for me, where it's at, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like your T-shirt, by the way. That's really cool. The yeah, I, I live in North Carolina, and I, I live about two hours away from the from the Moog factory. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, so I went to a visit to the Moog factory, and I bought this T-shirt. It shows you how technology and music influences music, because the Moog has been, you know, it's like the Fender guitar, you know, Moog. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you a little story. We've got a couple of minutes. Um, Larry Fast, who we used to play with the original band, uh, he did, he was on Recycled. He was on Magic as a Child. And he worked with Bob Moog on developing the polyphonic Moog. Hmm. Uh, Moogs used to be one note at a time. And when we played Beacon Theatre in New York, uh, we got to play the very first polyphonic mood oh we played nice. we, we did two shows on saturday and larry played the polyphonic mood and the next night uh chick career played played it to oh, never wow. be, never been seen before cool cool that's a little bit of musical history for you yeah it's nice to live through all that history amazing oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, you have a great rest of your day, and uh, we'll talk to you some other time. And I look forward to uh, listening to your new album. Great. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye now.